I want to start by talking about the current situation of the state and nation. Most of us are tired of talking about COVID-19. And many of us thought that once people were vaccinated, most of the problems would go away. But unfortunately, it's become clear that this isn't going away anytime soon. COVID will be part of our lives for quite some time. The good news is, because of our highest in the nation vaccination rate, as the country has endured Delta, we've maintained one of the lowest hospitalization and death rates in the nation while leading in testing. But the virus is crafty and persistent, and it keeps spreading, and mostly amongst the unvaccinated. If you're still unvaccinated, I want to be clear, you'll be infected sooner or later. It's just a matter of time. And if you're unvaccinated and you get it, the data is clear. Over the last several weeks in Vermont, you're about 30 times more likely to be hospitalized if you're not vaccinated and boosted. But it's important to remember, though vaccines are good at preventing disease in the first place, their primary function is to prevent severe illness. And if you're six months from your initial doses, it's important to get your booster to keep this protection as strong as possible. From the very beginning, protecting our healthcare system has been our top priority. The fact is, unvaccinated adults are undermining that objective. Because even though they're about 5% of the population, they account for about 75% of the hospitalizations. And last week, there were days the unvaccinated made up 90% of the ICU. Let me repeat that. Just 5% of adults are creating over 75% of our problem in hospitals. The unvaccinated also account for over 70% of cases. While kids are a large percentage of this, fortunately, for the most part, they aren't ending up in the hospital. And many more are now eligible for vaccination. You've probably heard, and the press has certainly reported on, the demands of some to move back to the mandates of 2020, which would impact all Vermonters. You've heard me talk at length over the last several weeks about why I don't think we should reinstate mandates and continue to live under a perpetual state of emergency more than 20 months into this, while we approach 90% of our total population having at least one dose. And we're not alone here, as President Biden and most other states have taken similar positions, including those with governors who are Democrats. But there's another important reason why I'm not going to put broad restrictions back in place, and that's because the vast majority of Vermonters have stepped up, done the right thing, and gotten vaccinated. And as a result, they're not the problem. I simply can't justify going back into a state of emergency, putting restrictions on the 95% of Vermont adults who have done the right thing and gotten vaccinated, when the problem is being driven by less than 5% of that population, meaning unvaccinated adults, who by now have had every opportunity to get vaccinated and have decided not to. The reality is vaccines work, which allow those who are, un are unvaccinated to do many of the things we had to leave behind in 2020 and the first half of 2021. And let's not forget, many restrictions like mandatory distancing, gathering, and visitation limits had a negative impact on physical and mental health. The hundreds of thousands of people who did the right thing and are therefore not the problem should not be punished to protect the people who have chosen not to protect themselves. A few months ago, Vermont became one of the first states to implement a vaccine or test and masking requirement for state employees. The policy has worked and helped increase our vaccination rate. I've encouraged other employers in the public and private sector to use this as a model, and we're going to increase that effort. 
In the coming weeks, my team will meet with trade associations, employers, and other organizations to talk through the benefits of requiring vaccination or testing for employees where we continue to see transmission. The science tells us that virus spread is much more likely to occur in settings where you're with someone for over 15 minutes, as opposed to brief interactions in places like convenience stores. In addition, restaurants, bars, and clubs are places where these types of longer interactions occur, and masking is obviously much less practical there as well. But vaccines have made it safe to go to places like these again, and that's a good thing. And we're also uh, seeing a number of them require proof of vaccination at the door as a way to help keep everyone protected, which I think is a good idea, at least for right now. As a reminder, 18 to 29-year-olds have a lower vaccination rate than any other age band. Putting in place vaccine or test requirements will help prevent virus spread and keep employees from missing work. And we'll have more on this soon. But in order to make this strategy more successful, we're continuing our work to secure tens of thousands of rapid tests to give out to Vermonters at no charge. As we've said, securing this supply is a challenge, but we're getting closer. Last week, we announced a rule that requires commercial insurance companies to reimburse for these tests. But that doesn't, that doesn't cover everyone. And it's important we provide these tests to all. Because this is the future. And rapid tests will be much more prevalent in our lives. And we hope to have more information on this effort in the coming days. Lastly, we're going to step up our efforts to get more boosters into our arms. While Vermont is the national leader for boosters, we still have much more work to do. Over the weekend, Dr. Fauci was asked whether the definition of fully vaccinated would change to include someone who has received their booster. He said, it's more likely a matter of when, not if. We want Vermonters to get ahead of this and think of it that way right now. If it's been six months since your second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, or two months since J&J, &J, don't consider yourself fully protected unless you've gotten a booster. Waning immunity on top of whatever impacts Omicron could have makes getting your booster essential. While the initial doses worked well at preventing severe disease and illness for, for Delta, a booster will greatly, greatly reduce the chance of getting it in the first place. So we're going to launch booster campaigns similar to our aggressive approach with vaccines a year ago. The goal is to make it easy and accessible uh, for all people to get maximum protection. If you get boosted right now, you'll be much more protected by Christmas and New Year's. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for his update. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, taking a look here first at Vermont's case counts for the past week, you can see that uh, we did, did experience a reprieve from the surge following Thanksgiving. Cases were down in Vermont 15 percent, while at the same time cases were up across New England 19 percent. So Vermont stood out this week uh, in terms of the direction of our cases with 350 fewer cases this week. Uh, than what we reported last week. And when you look at the numbers relative to the amount of testing and the positivity rate, you will see that testing was down over the last seven days, about 10%. So maybe some of that decrease was attributable to testing. Uh, but at the same time, Vermont continues to lead the nation in the number of tests conducted uh, for any jurisdiction. And you can see there that the positivity rate uh, decreased a bit this week as well. So uh, while testing did go down, it appears that cases were down uh, as a result of lower uh, virus infection as well. 
And when you look at the next slide, one that we've been showing regularly, uh, you can again see the difference in that fully vaccinated and not fully vaccinated rate, about 5.1 times greater for those who are not fully vaccinated. And you'll also see that the biggest decrease came in that fully vaccinated rate as well, decreasing about 16% over the last week. As the governor mentioned, uh, there is new analysis here relating to how effective boosters have been in Vermont to protect those from the most severe outcomes, including hospitalization and death. This analysis here that will show, this is looking at Vermonters 18 and older and comparing these populations that are not vaccinated, populations that are fully vaccinated but not boosted, and then those who are fully vaccinated with a booster shot. And as you'll see, those who are not fully vaccinated were 30 times more likely to require hospitalization over the last six weeks compared to those who were fully vaccinated and boosted. Similarly, on the next slide, you'll see a, a comparable analysis, but looking at fatalities. Again, this is looking at the 18 and older population uh, and similarly looking at the last six weeks. And here you'll see a similar dramatic difference. Those not fully vaccinated were 34 times more likely to die from COVID-19 over the last six weeks compared to those who were fully vaccinated and boosted as well. So that data is really clear for Vermont. It matches data that we're seeing across the country as well, that the effectiveness of the booster, particularly to keep people out of the hospital uh, and those uh, from dying uh, is highly effective. Also tomorrow is the, first, uh, is the anniversary from the first dose of the vaccine being delivered in Vermont. Uh, an analysis that we have done, uh, re that we refreshed from earlier this year, estimates that in Vermont alone, 930 lives have been saved from the vaccine being available to Vermonters over the past year. So again, something else to be um, uh, proud about in terms of Vermont's ability to go out and get vaccinated, but we need to continue to do that and particularly do it as it relates to the boosters as well. Looking at the case rate slide, you'll see that the uh, ages that are the most vaccinated and most boosted, that 65 and older, continues to have the lowest case rates here compared to the other age groups. You will see all of the age groups are generally down this week as cases are down. Uh, but again, that big difference between the 65 and older, our most vulnerable population, which is important to see. Looking geographically at the cases, you'll see some improvement in the worst hit areas of the state from last week, particularly Bennington County. But at the same time, cases are elevated in southern Vermont, and that's where we're seeing hospitalizations as well in uh, Rutland, Bennington, and a few hospitalizations now in Wyndham County at Brattleboro as well. Uh, looking at the next slide, we're looking at our modeling slide that basically is the same story uh, that we've seen uh, over the last month or so. We're not anticipating cases will go down over the next four weeks. And in addition to that, there's some uncertainty that comes with the Christmas and New Year's holiday relating to the gatherings that will occur. And in fact, we do anticipate uh, that cases will rise following those holidays, probably on the upper end of our projections over the next two or three weeks following those holidays. And you'll see that on the next slide as well. Uh, we track very closely to last year when we saw an increase when colder weather set in, a decrease following Thanksgiving because of a testing decrease, uh, then a slow, gradual decline leading up to Christmas and New Year's. Again, we're following a similar pattern as last year. We just saw a larger surge after Thanksgiving, but we still anticipate cases will increase uh, after Christmas and New Year's. So do everything that you can to prevent that or to make it as uh, unimpactful as possible by getting boosted, wearing a mask, staying home if you're, if you're sick, and all of the other health precautions. Looking across the higher education campuses, you'll see we had 104 cases this week. That is the most that we've reported in a single week. Uh, just by a single case, we had 103 earlier in the semester. Many of those cases attributable to the outbreak that's been reported at Middlebury College. Elsewise, uh, the colleges and higher education was pretty quiet this week. Looking at long-term care facility, you'll see that uh, the numbers are down again, just 29 active cases associated with an outbreak that are shown here on the slide uh, and a relatively small number of total outbreaks as well. Moving over to hospitalizations, you'll see similarly here some improvement over what we have been seeing the last few weeks. The overall hospitalization numbers remain flat this week. 
Uh, also, 72% of those uh, in the hospital have been those not vaccinated over the last seven days. On the ICU side, you see that we are declining about 8% over the last week, and again, about 77% of those requiring ICU over the last seven days not uh, vaccinated. Looking at the next slide, you'll see the availability of both the hospital beds and ICU beds. The hospital bed availability stayed relatively flat uh, as the uh, numbers stayed relatively flat, but ICU availability did tick up this week, uh, providing some additional rooms. But again, still uh, only with 11 rooms, I think, available today or yesterday, still something to be m mindful of and cautious and, and look at very closely. Looking at the COVID-19 deaths so far for the month of December, we are now at uh, 20 deaths for the month. I mentioned earlier the uh, the difference between those that are fully vaccinated and boosted compared to those who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, another trend that we're seeing in the fatality data is just when you look at the raw number of individuals dying more recently, the number of people dying who are not vaccinated is greater than the number of people who are fully vaccinated or fully vaccinated with a booster. So again, it just supports that data from earlier. It just shows the importance of getting vaccinated because it is protecting people uh, from the worst COVID-19 outcomes. Looking at our vaccination data, you can see number one across the board on most of these metrics. Uh, and then flipping on the next page, one that we've been watching closely, five to 11 year olds. Uh, you can see Vermont is just under 50% for those that have a single, or a single dose and about 25% for those who are fully vaccinated. So making good progress there, but again, we'd like to see that tick up a little bit more. And then finally, looking at the booster data, similarly, Vermont uh, near uh, or at the top on most of these metrics, we did cross the 70% of those 65 and older who are fully vaccinated that have received a booster. So that's great. We're seeing that impact in the hospitalizations and our fatality numbers. So we definitely want to keep that up for anyone that's over 65 or anyone that's over 18 that's eligible for their booster uh, to go and get it today. So with that, I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Pichak. Good afternoon. Um, there are three mitigation strategies that we're implementing to prevent COVID-19 uh, from disrupting the education of our children. Those three strategies are vaccination, testing, and the in-school uh, recommendations for mitigation. Of these three, vaccination is by far and away the most important. Um, in the 12 and older school population, more than 75% of the students are now fully vaccinated. And last week, uh, the CDC extended its recommendation for boosters to 16 and 17 year olds. We strongly encourage all 16 and 17 year olds to get the booster uh, when they're at least six months past the second dose of their Pfizer vaccine. Um, just a reminder that the Pfizer vaccine is the only authorized vaccine for the students in this age band. Vermont's success in adolescent vaccination will no doubt uh, be pointed at the major variable that explains the difference we're seeing in the relative stability in our schools. Uh, in particular, our high schools this year are operating in much more stable manner than our elementary schools. I think that's something uh, we should be proud of uh, compared to where we were last year with the amount of hybrid learning we saw in high schools. But this year, high schools are operating very continuously, relatively speaking. Um, and we're confident as the elementary level vaccination rolls out that we will see improved stability at the elementary level. Uh, to date, as Commissioner Pichak highlighted, we're around 50% of the 5 through 11 population have received at least one dose or registered in the system to get their first dose. And we're about 25% have completed uh, both doses. Um, and Secretary Smith will highlight some more of this information in his report. Uh, we do expect uh, 5 through 11 vaccination to make an impact on elementary school operations around mid-January. Uh, we do anticipate that this impact will be uneven across the state uh, due to the differences in vaccination rates. Some elementary schools will have higher student vaccination rates than others. Uh, so we are working on plans to support those schools that have lower vaccination rates. Our response testing, including test to stay, continues to roll out uh, steadily across the state and is contributing, uh, I think, significantly to keeping more kids in school when we do have cases. Uh, for the last three weeks uh, or so, we've seen about a 20 to 30 percent increase in the number of schools conducting test to stay antigen testing on a weekly basis. Last week, 172 schools conducted antigen, antigen testing under test to stay. 
Uh, last week, uh, we also saw the largest number of antigen tests being administered in schools in a single week. Uh, last week, we had 5,194 tests uh, administered under test to stay. Um, we are starting to see enough data now that our health department's epi team is starting to do some preliminary analysis of the, uh, the epi data from the antigen testing. Uh, the data seem to indicate a 0.9% average positivity rate. Uh, this includes tests administered for both students and staff. Um, and we do have a few schools that have higher positivity rates in the 5 to 6% range. We can't make a direct comparison between uh, the antigen test positivity rate and the broader state uh, positivity rate as a result of the PCR testing, uh, but the low positivity rate from the antigen test uh, does, does confirm our perception that test to stay allows us to uh, focus with some more precision on identifying cases in schools and certainly helps us uh, enabling students to stay in school as a result. So again, uh, preliminary data, but it confirms our perception that test to stay is a really important strategy. Last week, uh, we did expand test to stay to include pre-K sites in the public schools. Uh, we are working on implementing it in the private pre-K and the child care centers and hope to announce that expansion after the first of the year. On a related note, uh, we're working on an issue related to expiring antigen test kits. Uh, we knew some of the testing kits would expire soon, uh, so we're working with schools to help prioritize the use of those kits and uh, get them used up prior to their expiring dates. Uh, expiration dates. Uh, one strategy we are suggesting for schools is that they conduct broader antigen testing uh, before the holiday break. Uh, we are recommending schools offer one or more days of mass antigen tests to all the students and staff who are signed up for the response testing. Uh, this will help us identify additional cases prior, prior to the holiday vacation uh, and give families some additional peace of mind as they gather for the holidays. Vaccination and testing will remain the cornerstones of our school mitigation strategy, uh, but we'll continue to provide recommendations on the mitigation measures for schools uh, to use in their operations as conditions evolve, particularly as we monitor the spread of the Omicron variant. Uh, we have a recommendation on wearing masks in schools that has been adopted by all schools in the state but one. In our recommendation on masking, we suggest also that masks are not necessary in schools when student vaccination re rates each reach 80%. Um, however, we've delayed the implementation of that recommendation on two occasions this fall based on changing conditions of the virus. And currently, the go-live date for this recommendation is January 18th. The last time we adjusted the date for this recommendation was at the end of October. Uh, we set the date to mid-January in anticipation of needing to reassess conditions after the holiday vacation. Uh, I wanted to, just to highlight today that our recommendations for schools like this one continue to evolve based on the conditions, and if conditions change, we'll uh, make uh, adjustments to those recommendations accordingly. Uh, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start off with an update on boosters as well as vaccines for children 5 to 11. Then I'll provide an update on hospital capacity and some changes in hospital reporting. 197,883 Vermonters have received a booster shot. That's over 46% of the state's population that are ages 18 and over. And 16 and 17-year-olds can now get a booster. 22,436 children ages 5 to 11 have received their first dose of COVID vaccine or they have made an appointment to get their shot. That's roughly 51% of all Vermont children ages 5 to 11 years old. If you have a child who is 5 years or older, please get them vaccinated. You can make an appointment by going to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or you can simply call 855-722-7878. Now, shifting to hospital capacity. As I've mentioned before, we have a three-pronged strategy to reduce stress on our hospitals. Number one, prevent hospitalizations in the first place. Number two, transfer those from hospitals who still need care, but not necessarily hospital care. And number three, expand the capacity of ICU beds in the state. So now let's talk about what we're doing for prevention. As you know, we continue to have a robust vaccination program, the best in the nation. It combines the capabilities and resources of the state, the National Guard, our healthcare providers, EMS, 
and our network of retail pharmacies. We are supplementing the vaccination effort with an expanded monoclonal treatment program. We've added FEMA contracted paramedics and EMS personnel to support monoclonal treatment sites. EMS and FEMA teams will provide additional monoclonal antibody capabilities at hospitals across the state with mobile capacity to serve long-term care facilities with cases and where el wherever else needed. As of now, EMS teams are delivering monoclonal uh, antibodies at Rutland Regional Medical Center and Northwestern Medical Center. Beginning as early as Friday, they will be at UVMMC. They will also respond to outbreaks at long-term care facilities. We expect the FEMA teams to arrive late this week. Their work will focus on additional capacity at hospitals across the state. As for transferring patients out of hospitals back in October, anticipating a hospital surge, we opened up 80 subacute beds. Recently, we made an additional agreement for a total of 39 more beds in three long-term care facilities. So far, 19 of the 39 subacute beds have come online. We have the ability to add more beds as needed. In terms of ICU beds, the UVM Medical Center now has five additional ICU beds online, and Northwestern Medical Center added two additional ICU beds. One additional ICU bed is now available at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, with another one expected to be operational soon. As you remember, 10 is our number that we're looking for. We're getting towards there, but we still are going to be open, trying to open up more ICU beds. As Commissioner Pichek has pointed out, 40, excuse me, 72 percent of, of those hospitalized with COVID are unvaccinated. The numbers are higher, 77 percent, for those that are in the ICU and unvaccinated. Every morning, every single morning I get a report, and so does everyone up on this stage, get a report on the positive cases in Vermont. And consistently, as the governor said, over 70% are unvaccinated. With the bulk of the unvaccinated people being capable of being vaccinated. We are spending considerable amounts of money and resources to accommodate those that are not vaccinated and end up in our hospitals. It puts a stress on the system and takes away a hospital bed that may be needed for other hospitalizations that are not COVID related. And frankly, it's unfair to those that have done the right thing and gotten vaccinated, but now must pay for the actions of those that aren't vaccinated. I realize that Vermonters have a choice, but some choices have consequences. In this case, refusing to get the vaccine results in higher hospitalizations and stress on the healthcare system at significant cost. I'm asking Vermonters, I'm trying everything to convince Vermonters to please get vaccinated. It is simple and easy in this state. It is the most effective tool to fight the virus and protect your community. Turning to hospital reporting, we are making a change in the facilities that are included in our COVID hospitalization reporting. After identifying an issue that was giving us an inaccurate count of people hospitalized for COVID. The Brattleboro Retreat and the Vermont Psychiatric Hospital currently report COVID cases in their hospitals. However, that does not give an accurate picture to make a hospital capacity decision. In reality, patients are hospitalized at these locations for reasons unrelated to COVID. And if they need hospitalization because of COVID, they are transferred to a hospital for treatment. Put simply, even though they're not being treated for COVID, they're being counted simply because they are COVID in one of COVID positive in one of these facilities. Therefore, to more accurately reflect our COVID hospitalizations, these two facilities will be treated like other congregate living facilities for reporting purposes. Just a few quick updates, as Commissioner Pichek talked about, 
in his hospital up his um, higher education update, there was an outbreak at Middlebury College. Within a day, the state set up four additional testing clinics in the town of Middlebury. This accounted for more than 500 additional appointments for people to get tested over the weekend. We also distributed around 400 rapid at-home tests within the community. And finally, I just want to continue to talk a little bit about testing here. We continue working to get Vermonters access to at-home rapid tests. We expect more rapid tests to be delivered to this state and used throughout the holidays. Uh, all the information about what, you, what to do if you test positive for COVID-19, including reporting your status, especially with some of these uh, take-home tests, is on the Health Department's website. Go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 positive. You can also, like I said, call the, the hotline at 855-722-7878. As always, thank you for doing your part to keep Vermont safe. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. <clears throat> Thank you. Heard a lot of numbers this morning. I'm going to focus on what I want to help you accomplish, what you should do as we approach these next few weeks. Obviously, we're still in a very challenging uh, stage of the pandemic, seeing high levels of virus spreading through our communities and more people in the hospital with COVID-19. But vaccination continues to protect the majority of Vermonters from severe outcomes. But older people and those with underlying conditions still remain at risk. <clears throat> at the same time, we've also been living with COVID-19 for so long now that I know that many of you are just playing over it, trying to live your lives once again. And I get it. The strains on our mental and emotional well-being are far beyond anything many of us have ever experienced before. However, there is a balance to how we live with this virus. The more we can reduce the risk of spreading the virus as a regular part of our daily lives, the less we need to worry about it. We'll be healthier, we'll keep the most vulnerable safe, <clears throat> lower the burden on healthcare workers, and others who are simply burned out with this relentless response work. So remember the basic steps to protect one another as we plan ahead for the next holiday gatherings. First, have the talk before you go. Find out whether people will be vaccinated, boosted, or if extra precautions need to be taken for anyone who may be sitting around the table at higher risk, such as wearing a mask when you're not eating. Keep it small. The more people in households, the higher the chance that someone could have the virus and expose others. Have a strategy for testing. Get tested before you gather to protect everyone. You can use a rapid at-home test kit, which typically calls for one test one day or two before the gathering, and the other the same day you will be gathering. That helps make sure that if you have a negative result, it is accurate. And of course, if you have symptoms, even mild ones, choose to skip the event and stay home. While this decision can be hard, the flexibility is key to keeping others safe. Finally, plan to test once again five to seven days after such a gathering, even if you're fully vaccinated, even if, even if you don't have any symptoms. As you've heard, we are continuing to transition testing opportunities to having more free rapid testing options for Vermonters. And these kinds of self-tests are a critical risk reduction measure along with vaccination, masking, and other strategies. Not only do they produce quick same-day results, they're also more convenient and easy to use. 
As I've said before, the most important step you can take right now is to get your booster shot, if you haven't already. This includes the fact that 16 and 17 year olds who are now approved to receive a Pfizer booster following federal authorization last week. We lead the nation in boosters, but that's clearly not enough at this point in time. We need to be well above a 50% threshold with Delta and knowing all we know about it and with Omicron on the horizon. Because as I said last week, you are not fully protected until you've gotten that booster if it's been six months since your mRNA vaccine or two months since J&J. &J. And I base this on all the evidence we have with the Delta variant, which currently makes up 100% of cases in Vermont. <clears throat> in addition, there's now emerging data from the UK and Israel regarding the Omicron variant. And it shows that there is loss of protection from infection if you've only had a two-dose series and that a third vaccine dose will provide considerable defense against the new variant. There are also early indications, based on the relatively few cases we have in the United States, that the rate of breakthrough infection will be higher, but the vaccines will still protect us against more serious outcomes if you've had the third dose. Now, while the data around this new variant is new and emerging, it currently supports what we've been saying all along. Vaccines are the most effective protection against bad outcome, serious illness, hospitalization, death. This protection depends on you being up to date and fully protected. <clears throat> it means a three-dose series, whether you call the third dose a booster or something else. Now, as scientists are gathering more information on this variant and Delta cases continue to surge, the time to protect ourselves is now, today. We have still not found Omicron in Vermont, but it's been found in many U.S. states, including now all of our border states and our border country. We're continuing our genetic sequencing work with Broad Institute and our own public health lab Burlington continues to do wastewater sampling, and it has not been detected there yet. We'll certainly inform Vermonters when, not if, Omicron is identified in our state. <clears throat> you can find a clinic, including walk-in opportunities, at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. We consider the third dose so essential to our future success in Vermont that we are now still one of the few states where state-run clinic opportunities are in abundance. Last week, I had a special message for the unvaccinated Vermonter. Get a COVID test as soon as you have symptoms so that you can avail yourself of monoclonal antibodies, which could save your life, could prevent a hospitalization. But you need to test yourself and recognize these symptoms before you require hospitalization. I have another message for you today. Look at the data that you've seen presented, especially the percentages of ICU admissions and deaths among those who are unvaccinated. Let that data speak to you as you think about your own risk. And if someone that uh, you know is not yet vaccinated, help them understand this data. Or if someone has not yet vaccinated their child, help them understand the data and think about how you can help them with their decision. Talking to them about the benefits of vaccination, listening to their concerns with empathy, helping them find their own reason to get vaccinated, helping them find a trusted source of information. These are all ways we can influence our friends and loved ones without blaming or shaming. Getting vaccinated can even be a gift to, do, to your loved ones this season, a time when we try to think of others. In closing, 
We need to respect and protect one another right now. Respect the highly contagious nature of the virus and respect one another by staying home when you're sick, putting on your mask in public places, and sometimes even in private indoor settings. What does protect really mean? Protect one another. Think of the most vulnerable person in your life. What could happen to them if they got COVID-19? If we all work to protect that person, we protect our families, our friends, our coworkers, our hospitals, indeed, our whole community. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Governor, you're obviously sticking to your guns on the masking idea, but uh, we haven't seen Omicron here yet, and uh, that's supposed to be even more rapidly, more contagious than, uh, than Delta is. I mean, when that presumably is going to arrive sometime, could that change your mind? Well, obviously, we'll continue to evaluate as uh, conditions change or, or don't change. Uh, we're hearing a lot of different opinions about Omicron, um, but I, I think uh, the jury is still out in some respects. We, we don't know. I've heard some reports that it's um, highly transmissible, um, but not as um, severe uh, in, in terms of illness uh, that uh, like Delta has, but time will tell. But obviously, um, we will continue to evaluate on a daily basis, and if if uh, something changes, um, as we've done in the past, we'll make those uh, decisions uh, to protect Vermonters. Governor, you mentioned the 5% of unvaccinated Vermonters that are having an effect on, on all Vermonters, that 95%. Do you know, maybe this is Commissioner Pichet question, how many uh, people uh, make up that 5%? I, th I think it's somewhere between 30 and 50,000, but... Yeah. I think that's right, Governor, 40,000. 40, 40,000. 40, you, know, you talk about the need to deliver shots um, and deliver boosters. I mean, what, what more can be done? I know you said that you're, you're working with trade associations, but should there be harder steps taken? Well, you know, we've seen uh, some restaurants uh, that have made uh, uh, vaccinations mandatory uh, or you don't get in. It's like a vaccine passport. And that's up to the individual business. I attended a uh, trade association dinner uh, last week. I didn't stay for the dinner, but I spoke at it. And uh, they had a policy as well. Uh, there were over 200 people there, but you had to be vaccinated in order to attend. So we're seeing signs of this uh, throughout Vermont, and, and I think that the, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and, and if you don't, like we've done with uh, vaccine uh, requirements or testing, uh, masking and testing requirements for state employees, uh, we'd like to uh, see more businesses uh, take that approach as well. But we're, we're working on that. That more information is to come in the in the next couple of days about the the more robust booster program you you hinted at but i think a lot of vermonters are impressed at the availability of shots so what are some areas that you're looking to improve upon that we upon what we already have today i think there are is a certain population that is tired again i'm frustrated just don't want to talk about um COVID any longer uh, so they they uh, think of themselves as being fully vaccinated when the data clearly shows that those uh, vaccines have waned, the efficacy has waned, uh, and the booster is necessary in order to be fully protected. And I'm not sure that message is getting out, uh, and we need to be more direct uh, and make sure that we give the statistics uh, in order for them to better protect themselves and their families. So we just want to make sure they have all the information because it's clear. It's clear as day. Uh, that uh, the boosters are part of the answer. So it's more a messaging campaign rather than the way that the shots right. are administered. Right, that's correct. More of a messaging campaign, uh, and uh, we have some ideas on how to how to do that, uh, but um, but we'll have more in the days to come. Governor, a question on a completely different topic. Next year is shaping up as a pretty interesting political year in Vermont. Have you given any thought yet to whether you're going to run for re-election next year? Um, 
obviously, uh, it's it's on my mind uh, every now and then. Uh, some days uh, it's more on my mind than others, uh, but I'm focused on on COVID at this point, uh, developing policies for the state of the state address, as well as for our budget address in January. So I'm going to focus on that uh, and then make a decision. When you say it's on your mind, are you getting uh how to put it politely, fed up with the job? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, you know, it's it's um, obviously this isn't uh, the optimum time uh, to be governor, uh, but uh, but it has its rewards, and we have done some amazing things. I have a great team, and I uh, I thank uh, my uh, I thank my um, lucky stars uh, that. Uh, that I have the team surrounding me that I do, uh, because we've done a lot of good for Vermont, and uh, we want to continue to do so. So, again, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not tired of uh, the responsibility or the position, um, but um, but I have to just weigh things out and make sure it's best for Vermont and for myself. Governor, also unrelated uh, to COVID, question for you and Secretary Smith too, if you can jump in afterwards. What is your response to the lawsuit against the state regarding claims of abuse at the Woodside Juvenile Center? Yeah, um, obviously there's not much I can say. Uh, it's in the hands of lawyers at this point. Um, but um, but we, we shut down that facility uh, a number of months uh, ago uh, and uh, are looking in a different direction for it wasn't as effective. It wasn't moving in the right direction. It wasn't the treatment that we wanted to uh, to give and uh, we wanted to use a different setting and it was uh, it cost a lot of money uh, in in terms of the uh, the program that existed so we made a change and we closed it down uh, secretary smith yeah i i'm not going to add too much more other than you know it wasn't meeting the needs of the children in that particular group and so we made the decision to close it down uh, and really um, push that decision. We have decided to go in a more therapeutic direction, and that's one of the things that we would like to do in Newberry is, is develop a therapeutic um, setting for these type of in individuals, these type of kids as we're moving forward. That's a, what this is about now, is, is how we're gonna move forward in a therapeutic sort of environment. Has the state filed its appeal? I believe we have, Calvin. I'll double check, but I believe we have. Messaging campaign. One of the things that caught my ear from Commissioner Pichek is this number about the 930 lives that very likely were saved by vaccines. I think that's quite impressive. Um, Commissioner Pichek, if you wouldn't mind sort of explaining how you arrived at that number, and then Governor, reflect on on that figure because I yeah. do think it's impressive. Again, we, uh, we lead the nation in the lowest number of deaths uh, in gross numbers as well as per capita and have continued to do so over a, quite a period of time. So we're, we're pleased with that. But any death uh, is, uh, is unfortunate and uh, we strive every day uh, to try and protect people. And that's why we want to make sure that we provide the boosters uh, and the protection needed uh, to prevent loss of life. Yeah, thank you, Governor. So there's really two parts to that analysis, uh, Jack. One is to look at uh, what were the fatality rates by age prior to the vaccine being available, and then taking a look at uh, how many people in those age groups are being infected once the vaccine did become widely available, and what's that difference in the fatality rate. It's also, uh, you also need to anticipate what's the difference in the infection rate as well. You know, without the vaccine, you would anticipate there would be more infections in Vermont uh, starting from last winter all the way through today, particularly with Delta. So that reduction in infections and then that reduction in fatalities brought on by the greater protection, particularly in those 65 uh, or older. So that's really the sort of highlights of how that analysis is put together. Were you impressed with that number? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you think of how, uh, how many deaths we've had uh, to date in Vermont, and it's, you know, it's unfortunate, as the governor said, of every death and having 436 is, uh, you know, it's the lowest or one of the lowest in the country. So Vermonters have that to be proud of. It's still unfortunate that we've had those deaths. Uh, but it is impressive when you think about Vermonters stepping up to protect nearly a thousand people, uh, you know, from also succumbing to the virus in our state. 
Governor, how strong is the state's supply of those at-home tests at this point? Do we have enough heading into Christmas as people get tested, you know, before and after gathering? Yeah, I don't have uh, the numbers at my fingertips. Um, maybe Secretary Smith does, but uh, we feel okay at this point, uh, but, uh, but we're working on a number of different initiatives to provide more. If everything holds true, knock on wood, um, we should have 10,000 lamp tests and 50,000 antigen tests for the holiday season. So that's what we're gearing to. Uh, they should be coming in this week and the first part of next week. Yeah, as, as well as our ongoing PCR testing that um, you asked about the rapid tests, so those are the rapid tests. Thank you. Governor, also, it appears as though this year, this coming session, the Ed Fund is going to have a, some $90 million surplus. How do you envision pitching to the legislature to, uh, to have that money spent? Well, again, I put that in the, uh, the message in the letter. Uh, I think half of it should be given back to taxpayers uh, and uh, utilize the other portion uh, to further the other crisis we're facing, which is a workforce shortage. Uh, and if it means putting more into our CTE programs uh, in school and education uh, to give the desired result of, uh, of uh, training more people for our workforce, uh, that's where I'd like to see the rest of it. But I'm sure the legislature might have some of their own ideas. Well, you say why, why not for the pensions or for school repairs or, or others? Well, again, if it's an excess payment, uh, I think you'd, uh, you know, you might want to ask a few taxpayers what they think. Uh, I would say that taxpayers might say, why don't you just give it back to me if I overpaid? Um, so I would like to at least meet them halfway and uh, give them back uh, a rebate, uh, but also uh, to put it in areas, again, education-wise, where we can get the uh, desired results of having more um, being introduced to the workforce because we have a, a tremendous, tremendous need, a shortage of workers in this state. And uh, the training opportunities are going to be immense, uh, but also attracting more people to come to the state is going to be equally as, as important. All right, I'll move to the phone, starting with Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon, Governor. I have no questions uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You get a gold star today. <laughs> Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. I don't think I'm going to get that same gold star from you. You've, you've gotten very uh, few, very few. <laughs> <laughs> um, Governor, we keep hearing at these news conferences that the, the statistics show that uh, people who are being infected, many, 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 many of them are unvaccinated. We don't hear what the numbers are between the, the fully vaccinated and the fully protected, as Dr. Levine would put it, with a booster. Why is the state not presenting the numbers of, you know, the people that are getting infected that, that have been vaccinated of that percentage you know how many are are boosted and how many are not yeah i i think you make a good point because we're we're going to have to provide i think that would help uh the booster program if we were able to provide that information uh, obviously there's still going to be breakthroughs right whether you're fully um vaccinated fully boosted uh there are breakthroughs in that regard because nothing is 100 percent effective um, but it's the, the vast majority of those who are uh, fully uh, fully vaccinated and fully boosted um, are not in the hospital. I mean, you, you just see the data. I, I went through over the weekend and I saw, I took uh, Saturday's numbers uh, as a snapshot in time. We had 532 cases uh, on Saturday. 81.5% uh, of them were unvaccinated. And then when you look at um, at the numbers uh, of the, the cases themselves, you, I, do, I broke it out into thirds. Uh, so a, a third of the population, zero to 19 year olds, were made up a, a third of those cases um, that um, 
that uh, were, were um, positive cases. Uh, then uh, 20 to 39 made up another third. And then 40 and over was another third. But what you, what, when you broke that down and looked at who was hospitalized, uh, the zero to 19 year olds, which is a third of the, the cases, there was one, um, one case that was hospitalized. Uh, when you took the 20 to 39, another third of the cases, uh, there were five uh, who were in the hospital. You take the 40 and over, uh, which is the third of the cases, uh, 62 were in the hospital, uh, hospital as a result. So uh, I think it, it tells you a lot. The data uh, drives some of the decision making. And, uh, and I think that, I don't know, maybe Commissioner Pichak can elaborate on the boosters and other information. Yeah, thank you, Governor, and thanks, Greg, for the question. Just wanted to point out that when it comes to hospitalization data and uh, fatality data, uh, we are providing that breakdown and that difference between those that are not fully vaccinated, those who are fully vaccinated without a booster shot, and those who are fully vaccinated with a booster shot. So, as we said, you know, if you're fully vaccinated with a booster shot, you're significantly less likely uh, to end up in the hospital. Same is true if you're fully vaccinated. It's just a magnitude of difference. Those that are not fully vaccinated were 30 times more likely to end up in the hospital than those uh, fully vaccinated with a booster. And it's, uh, the difference is about seven times for those that are uh, fully vaccinated alone. And on the fatality side, you know, we said 34 times difference uh, between those not fully vaccinated and those fully vaccinated with a booster and about five times uh, difference for those just fully vaccinated. So still protection obviously there, but to maximize the protection, it's important to get uh, your booster as well. And I think Dr. Levine wanted to add something. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is that that is the important data. Again, the promise of vaccines to the public is you will not have the serious outcome, whether it be hospitalization or death. And the promise of boosting is similarly, you will be much less likely to have those serious outcomes. We currently have around a 2% breakthrough case rate. So your chance of becoming a case if you've been uh, vaccinated, 2%. Haven't done that with the boosters, but the point is, those aren't the numbers that matter. Every time people get a flu shot, we don't promise them they won't get the flu, but we would love to be able to promise them with high certainty that they won't have a serious outcome from the flu. That is what the vaccines are to do, and that's what we should be focusing on mostly. Even if it's just a, a case for transparency, shouldn't people know like a, a breakdown of uh, overall cases? How many how many people are vaccinated, unvaccinated, boosted, et cetera? Yeah, I think part of the dilemma has been the, the CD, CDC classification. And as I said, in my remarks, Dr. Fauci was asked over the weekend about this, and he said, it's not a question of, uh, of when, it's just a question, or if, it's a question of uh, when this is going to be uh, changed. Um, so it will be, it will be changed, and I, I would expect uh, that being fully vaccinated, um, that designation would include the booster at that point. And that okay. will clear things and, up uh, a little bit more. Thank you, Governor. And uh, finally, Governor, you probably heard of a, a, a case here in Franklin County, a, a well-known elementary school teacher, former varsity basketball coach, uh, caught sexual assault with a with a student over like a half dozen year period. Um, in that investigation, there were at least two DCF reports that came up that that teachers reported to DCF their concerns with with the student and teacher over a two, two school year period. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if that worries you a bit with DCF and, and if they can really protect Vermont's children if, if they're not investigating the reports that are coming in. And, and I heard from a reader this morning that, you know, why would, why would teachers want to continue reporting uh, beyond those, those two first initial reports if DCF didn't act. 
Yeah, um, obviously, uh, I don't have anything to add at this point in time. There is an active investigation. We'll get the facts uh, eventually, and, uh, and and I would agree uh, that uh, our our duty is to protect those kids, uh, and uh, we all have an obligation to make that happen. So we'll find out more as the, the investigation unfolds, um, but um, hopefully we'll all learn more about, uh, about what, what happened. Is, is DCF investigating internally as to what went wrong? Uh, Secretary Smith. Greg, as soon as I saw the report in the newspaper, I asked uh, DCF to start an internal investigation uh, through uh, Sean Brown, who had actually already started it himself uh, with what precisely happened. We, we don't, it just started. I don't have the information about anything yet. Uh, thank you. When, when those results come out, I, I hope they're public. Sure. I, I would imagine they would be. All right, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Rebecca. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, in light of those 40,000 people who could be but have chosen not to get vaccinated, uh, you know, there's an old expression, hit them where it hurts. Should they face diminished insurance coverage, have to pay more if they require hospitalization for COVID? Um, it's a good question. I mean, we're we're looking at every avenue in terms of encouraging coach uh, uh, coaching them to uh, to do the right thing. Um, I mean, it should be a consideration, I guess. But uh, but we I we haven't talked about that in particular. Um, we're we're still uh, trying to to show them the data uh, to educate them uh, in hopes that they will arrive at the right uh, conclusion, which is you will be helping yourself and your families um, a, a great deal more if you're vaccinated. Have you uh, seen any resignations or uh, has HR taken disciplinary action against state employees over the vaccination rule? Not that I'm aware of. Um, maybe is Secretary Clouser on at this point in time? Do you have any information on that? Thanks, Governor. I can certainly get some updated information from the Department of Human Resources and get back to you. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael, BT Digger. Hi, thank you. Uh, Governor, I wanted to ask, uh, based on your opening remarks, uh, I noticed lately when we talk about mitigation measures that we tend to hear about these all as one, uh, masking, lockdowns, gathering bans. Uh, you, you tend to put these all in the same category, whereas it seems as though a, a lot of health experts we've been hearing from draw a clear distinction between masking and all of these other types of policies. Um, and I, I wonder why now do you consider these all to be sort of one and the same? Some of the letters we've received from some of the legislative officials have uh, said that everything was on the table, masking and other measures, lockdowns and so forth. So that's why I go back to. That being said, though, you know, the, the way that local officials have had to, uh, to deal with this in terms of, uh, you know, considering local mask mandates uh, as that's been put through, um, you know, they, it seems to have had to kind of face this conversation specifically around masking. Um, and I wonder, you know, still when, when you're discussing this, we are hearing about things like lockdowns and gathering bans that, that no one has put on the table in terms of a, a, a serious proposal, whether that was mentioned in that legislative resolution or not. Uh, so I, I wonder why, do you see a distinction between masking and lockdowns, or do you see them as one and the same? Well, I, th I think it's all in one package in some respects, because if one fails, which I believe a mass mandate, uh, mandate, and I want to be clear about this. I've tried to be clear. Uh, it's not always reported that way. But I don't think man the mandate itself is effective. I think masking is effective, but mandating uh, the masking is not effective, and I don't think it's effective at this point. So. My fear is this. So we go and we, uh, let's say, um, the legislature decides to institute a, a mass mandate. 
and uh, does so legislatively. And it's in, and they have the votes to do so. Uh, they can override any veto uh, that I have because they have the numbers. So let's just say they implement that and it doesn't work, it fails. Um, so what are they going to go, do next? They're gonna go on and move on to the, something more, uh, which would be uh, closing of businesses or maybe uh, distancing or uh, eliminating gatherings and so forth. So there's a whole list of things that we've done since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, it's just, uh, that would be, from, from my perspective, uh, that might be where they would go uh, when they, find out that masking a mask mandate uh, isn't going to get them the results that they're hoping for. So far, they've said the opposite, though. I mean, in this current moment that we are in, they have been absolutely clear that lockdowns are not on the table from their perspective. Um, and so all they've really focused on so far is a statewide mask mandate. Um, so I wonder, you know, if, if that has not been proposed, it's been something they've been clear about avoiding, um, then why are those still you, being You, you must be reading different things than I am. I, I guess we, I, I don't know, I, I've, I've read where some have proposed other initiatives. So I guess we're going to have to uh, agree to disagree because I've, I've seen other things that have been written uh, about that and different ideas. So again, we'll see what they do. Um, but uh, but I want to be clear about what my um, my thoughts are on this issue, and we'll continue to try and protect the healthcare system as we have been, and uh, and we believe uh, that encouraging uh, masking uh, is important, as well as other mitigation measures. But certainly, um, we don't want to take the focus off from vaccines and boosters because that's the most effective, long term, most effective. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Thank you, Jason. Governor, um, Seven Days and BPR have done several stories recently on the human toll on the healthcare system. And of course, now we're talking about the need to add hospital beds and ICU beds. Yeah, um, Omicron is surrounding us. Uh, Delta is still alive and, and well, it appears. How are you going to? Um, how do we sat it, How we um, take pressure off the human beings that are are still fighting the good fight uh, after almost two years? Yeah, no, that's a, a good question, and uh, and a lot of it uh, is because of our labor shortage or workforce challenges, as you well know, in every sector across the state, uh, and but certainly in healthcare, uh, we had a nursing shortage before. Uh, the pandemic, and we are certainly uh, seeing that um, evolve and uh, not in a positive way. Uh, so um, we, uh, we are well aware of that. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can to alleviate the pressure and uh, get back to some sort of normalcy. Secretary Smith. Tim, that, you asked a really great question. Um, and I said this last week, uh, I, I do want to, uh, you know, say to the healthcare workforce out there, you know, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done. And what we're trying to do is relieve that workforce by moving, you know, beds uh, out of hospitals a little bit and not really creating a crowding situation. Um, we are trying to provide extra help in terms of monoclonal and testing and and vaccinations as well, where those would normally fall on the uh, health provider system as they do in other states or as they do into the retail pharmacy program, we have you know a fairly strong, uh, fairly strong, one of the strongest in the nation vaccination program testing programs uh, that can't be beat. So we are trying to t relieve the pressure that they, they are feeling in, in this state, but they're feeling it all over the United States right now. And hopefully, um, you know, what we're doing is, is providing a relief valve until what the governor just said, until we can get a long-term strategy to get more uh, nurses here in the state. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, 
Thanks uh, very much, uh, Governor. Wanted to follow up uh, some more on the lawsuit filed yesterday against those 22 current and former DCF employees for reportedly abusing children at the old Woodside Center. As was noted, it went on for apparently five years, according to the lawsuit. Um, and it appears that it is a real hot potato because DCF's own investigators reported in 2018 that the employees were violating state law, according to the lawsuit, and it still continued on. Um, DCF has apparently gone into hiding. Commissioner Sean Brown has not called back for two days with any comment. I was told your office reached out to DCF to urge a comment when no comment was forthcoming. They were going to reach out again. Still nothing from DCF. Uh, I don't know if it's a bunker mentality or what. The assistant AG for DCF also is missing in action. And TJ Donovan wanted to DCF only acknowledging that he's mandated to defend these people. Um, it's impossible to reach anybody at DCF. The state's online staff directory still less list Ken Schatz as the DCF commissioner, and he's been retired since June of 2020. The phone numbers listed are unreliable. The phone number for the lawyer DCF says it's an unused number at IBM in Essex. And as the problems were mentioned about Franklin County and the student and the teacher, there's ongoing problems everywhere with it in DCF, and they always claim confidentiality. Greg asked, and I guess it's an internal investigation, I'm wondering, is it really time for an, a real external investigation of DCF? I mean, you can have all the internal investigations you want, and if the lawsuit is correct, there were internal investigations at Woodside that showed ongoing state violations of state law. Nothing was done. So, I mean, can DCF police itself is a question. And can you get DCF even to update their names and phone numbers on the state directory so Vermonters can actually reach out to them? Secretary Smith. We'll have that update done within the next 24 hours, Mike. Uh, this is Mike Smith. You know, one of the things I just want to make sure that the record is clear, um, when one of the things that um, we did when we first came in, at, when I first came in at, um, at the agency, was to look at Woodside and made the decision within the first month that I was there that we were going to close that facility down. And the reason we were gonna close that facility down is because it wasn't meeting the needs of the kids uh, that were going. And we were going to go in a different direction, and we did go in a different direction. Now, I will get the website updated. I'll make sure you get some contacts back. But it is an ongoing uh, litigation right now. There's not a lot that we can say when we're being sued. You will see our response to it. At, at some point, um, and I suspect that Sean Brown, the commissioner, will tell you that it's an ongoing litigation and we're going to, um, uh, we'll present the facts on our side as well. But again, you know, we, we shut that place down uh, because it wasn't meeting the needs of the kids, and today it's leveled. But I guess the question is, should it be an external investigation? There's been these internals uh, you, you identified, uh, apparently, within a month of arriving on the job, uh, that the place ought to be shut down. The, the DCF Internal Affairs, or whatever it's called, the um, team found all sorts of violations, and yet, Nothing is done. I mean, should there be a real external investigation done and not yeah. as, uh, state employees protecting other state employees? As you know, I'm not afraid of external um, investigations. I've done one with DOC. Oh, exactly. So I figured you'd be happy to have one. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see where, what, what we have right at the moment. Um, and if it calls for an external investigation, I will call for an external investigation. Could be your going away present to the state. Could be in the next two weeks, Mike. 
<laughs> My other question is for Dr. Levine. Um, Vermont Health Department denied a public records request uh, uh, last month, and I appealed to your office on November 19th. Uh, I was wondering when I might get a response. Uh, under the law, you have five days, business days to respond. I think we're on day 15. Any uh, progress on that one? <clears throat> Mike, you're going to have to uh, allow me to get hold of the information and understand it better because um, I don't have eyes on that right now. We'll check into it and get back to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, I'm Davis of Vermont Journal. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, I've got I've got two questions. Uh, speaking of investigations, uh, at the end of uh, August, uh, early September, um, both the a both AHS and then backed up by the Greenmont Care Board began an investigation into the access problems they had at UVMMC um, with the idea that there would be uh, possibly le uh, proposed legislation to the legislature. Is there, when are we going to see that report? Is there any evidence? Is there any results from that investigation? Uh, when will we see it? Secretary Smith. I think the time frame for relieving, uh, releasing the preliminary report is January of 2022, and it is on track uh, to be uh, released during the first part of the legislative session, the first month of the legislative session, which is what we had planned to do. Thank you. My second question is for Mike Pichek. There's been, uh, there's been a, some speculation in the press just in the, within the last couple of days that when looking at the whole COVID monitoring, the whole COVID progress, that the real issue is the number of hospitalizations. Now, that doesn't mean that they've never been reported before they have. But what I'm curious about is uh, there's some places where they're, saying they're, 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 they're shifting their monitoring process to focus almost entirely on hospitalizations rather than the simple number of cases. What I'm curious about is whether you've looked at that, whether he've already done it. It sounds like the governor did some of it on his own over the weekend. Um, I wonder if you could say um, whether uh, the a focus on hospitalization as opposed to just cases of COVID uh, is a good idea, what you think of it and where you think it might go. Yeah, no, thanks, Sam, for the question. So, you know, hospitalizations obviously are critical. Uh, they're a good indicator. They uh, allow you to compare jurisdictions sort of apples to apples because some of the differences in, in testing, uh, you know, get melted away when you look at hospitalizations. Uh, but at the same time, cases still uh, do matter, and they do matter toward hospitalizations. Uh, you know, we look at not just what the total number of cases are, uh, we look at what's the mixture of cases by age and vulnerability and vaccination status. So if you have a lot of cases in people that are 65, unvaccinated and vulnerable, you know your hospitalizations are going to go up. There's just no doubt about it. If your cases are among people under 18 years old, fully vaccinated, uh, no vulnerabilities, you can anticipate you'll have very few hospitalizations over the next few weeks. So the, hospital, the cases still do matter in terms of informing the trends and what are likely to be seen in hospital in the hospitals. Um, but uh, obviously, you know, fortunately for us, we have such a high percentage of the vulnerable vaccinated and boosted uh, that um, we are seeing some uh, improvement in that age segment's hospitalization rate. Uh, just one final question, one, one more uh, loop on the, on the question of hospitalization. Is it, I, I, you know, let me ask the question this way. What are you seeing for hospitalization rates in critical access hospitals, which have 25 beds or fewer, may not have an ICU at all? That is more than half of our system. How much, how much hospital pressure is there in the critical access hospitals for COVID? Yeah, so I mean, when you look at our hospital numbers over the last two months, let's say, you know, they tend to fluctuate uh, primarily where there are a lot of cases in the community. The exception to that being UVM, which generally has had a lot of cases because they take a lot of patients from across the state. Uh, but um, at this moment, you know, when we look at our hospitalizations, Rutland, uh, Bennington, 
uh, Brattleboro uh, and uh, Central Vermont uh, and uh, UVM are the ones with most of the cases. The other hospitals will will infrequently have more than five cases if, you know, usually zero or a single digit. So I think some of that's about transferring them to other hospitals uh, because there have been instances where those communities have seen elevated case rates. Uh, th thank you. That's illuminating. I'm done. Uh, Ham, I just wanted to add one comment on your previous question because you sort of foreshadowed what's going to be happening in the future. You're really talking about going from pandemic to endemic. Pandemic, we really care about these cases. We care about every piece of data we present to you. When things are endemic, whether it be the common cold or the flu or now COVID in the near future, we hope, um, Cases are not really what you're measuring. You're measuring the serious outcomes and trying to use that data to influence your own policies and interventions along the way. And as we transition from a PCR-based, state-run testing center-based uh, testing strategy to a do-it-yourself at home or a rapid antigen test uh, strategy, we will lose a lot of the data about cases uh, unless every person who ever tested themselves reports into us uh, that they had a positive test. So cases will become less of a reliable indicator. Percent positivity of tests will become uh, unmeasurable, and we will be in a situation where we really are measuring those more serious outcomes. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine, I, I just wonder if you could just give me your gut reaction to whether you have a sense of how close we are to what you might call the endemic pandemic node where we fundamentally change. I think you, I, you, you asked the question better than I did, so I'd just like to ask you that. Yeah. How so close do you think we are? Getting there? Before Omicron appeared on the scene, I, I would have said March. Now, it's plus minus. Could be longer than that because Omicron could be a, another wave that really takes over everything in the country, but we don't know that yet. Or maybe it could be less than that because actually Omicron infects a whole bunch of people because it's supposed to be even more infectious than Delta. And if it gives a lot more people a milder infection but doesn't cause the serious outcomes and it sort of races through the population, Maybe we'll get to endemic even quicker. So uh, far be it for me to put a date or a specific timeline, but those are the scenarios that are possible. Uh, thank you for that. Lisa Loomis, the value reporter. Good afternoon. Um, Secretary Smith said the state is getting 10,000 LAMP rapid tests and 50,000 rapid antigen tests by Christmas. How will these tests be distributed? We'll still be, we're still working on that, Lisa, at various locations. But, it, you know, these are, um, the LAMP test will be done at a, a location within uh, one of our uh, vet, uh, testing sites in terms of the LAMP test. We'll hand out the, um, the antigen tests as we did in Middlebury over the, um, over the weekend. We'll hand out those tests to be used um, at home or you can just do them right there, but at home. And we will probably use the same locations to hand out sites at our testing sites. Um, it has, all the details haven't been worked out. We're gonna, we're gonna announce that next week of all the details. And when can people expect to be able to go to a pharmacy and um, pick up a couple of tests and have their insurance be billed? At Kinney Drug in Waterbury last week, the pharmacist said there was no process for distributing rapid tests and or billing insurance companies for those tests. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Commissioner Pichek for that answer. Yeah, thank you, Secretary Smith. So there has been uh, good progress just in the first week since the program was announced in terms of uh, getting some of the pharmacy benefit managers and down to the pharmacies uh, online. Uh, there was some uh, technical paperwork and things of that nature that had to get sorted out, uh, which is in place. 
Uh, so um, Blue Cross Blue Shield in particular has made good progress. I'm hopeful that it will be very short, shortly that those um, covered under uh, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield will have that avail avail availability. We're hopeful that all of the 140,000 Vermonters will have it before the holidays as well. So like we said, we'll need a little bit of patience. We anticipated a couple of weeks. Uh, we're sort of a week into it now. Uh, but certainly want to remind those that are covered that they can still seek reimbursement, and that's retroactive to December 1st. Thank you. And then just one quick follow-up on rapid testing. Yesterday, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker announced the purchase of 2.1 million eye health labs at-home rapid antigen tests for $5 per kit. Those tests will be delivered to 102 towns with the most families at poverty level. Towns will then distribute those tests free of charge to people. And the state's also making that price available for towns to purchase the test kits and pay for them using ARPA funds. Is that something Vermont might pursue, or at a minimum, might Vermont ask Charlie Baker if we can have that price? <laughs> yeah, uh, we would uh, we would take all that uh, Charlie Baker would give us uh, at five dollars a piece. Uh, but we're working on an initiative ourselves along the same lines. So, uh, as I said uh, in my remarks, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we hope to have some more information on that in the next week. And would this, would Vermont follow the model of distributing? the test to towns to pass out to residents and then ask towns to pay for their own tests with we, ARPA funds? We haven't determined uh, that at this point in time, but we'll be able to talk about that when we know we have the, uh, the tests available, and then we'll have a distribution plan as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. All right, we'll try Henry Epp, VPR. Henry? All right, we'll move to Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Uh, hello, Governor. Uh, hope you can hear me. We can. Oh, very good. Uh, so, sorry, just finding my questions. <laughs> Didn't expect to be on so soon. Um, so there's been a lot of concern uh, among some of my readers uh, who, who think that your administration is really not uh, taking seriously the, the VAERS data. We're also doing much to promote alternative treatments, uh, ivermectin, and until recently, uh, the uh, monoclonal antibody treatment uh, would you say that that's that's true and if so are you maybe a little bit more open than you have been in, in the past to promoting a vaccination and uh, alternative treatments well, we certainly uh, have talked a lot about monoclonal over the last number of weeks and uh, and been mm -hmm. successful in doing that so we want to continue in fact i mentioned that in some of my remarks as well, that uh, we want to make sure that we continue to advocate for that. But as you know, timing is everything. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, those who are uh, infected uh, and have those compromised conditions seek out the medical advice in order to take advantage of that. Uh, Secretary Smith talked about uh, some of the initiatives we have uh, using uh, uh, emergency management services uh, to to become more mobile, uh, going to long-term care facilities and other uh, approaches, uh, so that we are able to utilize what we think is is uh, just another tool in the toolbox that's uh, been quite effective. I don't know about the others. Uh, I have uh, heard again. I, I think I heard that uh, the CDC is considering the other. Uh, prescription or the drug form, uh, the pills uh, that are, are somewhat effective, but uh, I don't know much about that and when that's going to be available, but that that would fall into the same category as the monoclonal, I believe. So time will tell. Uh, Dr. Levine, anything you can add to that? <clears throat> yeah, I don't think there's any question that for months now we've been advocating for monoclonals and we get even stronger and stronger with it all the time. And our interactions with the healthcare system have been very positive in that regard. 
and yeah, um, created <laughs> even more um, healthcare practitioners who are interested in having this therapy for their patient. <clears throat> you used the word alternative before, and I'm wondering if you had other treatments in mind, because the ones the governor is referring to aren't yet available, uh, but will be in the month of December, I'm pretty confident, uh, and will also be important game changers for treating active COVID infection. But I have to be very clear, because I know uh, this comes up with some of your readers, Treatments are not a substitute for vaccination. The primary mitigation strategy is vaccine. The best way a person can help themselves is to prevent the infection from ever occurring. They won't deal with chronic symptoms, long haul, or anything of that sort. But did you have other things in mind when you used the word alternative? Well, uh, definitely ivermectin, but to the, to the point of the, of the vaccine as a primary treatment, a lot of my readers say um, no one's really seriously addressed in your administration the, their concerns about the VAERS data, that there are, there are so many more uh, cases of, of you know, serious problems coming out of that, and they just, uh, they, they don't really believe the idea that the vaccine is truly safe the way most vaccines are, are safe. Yeah, no, and I, and I understand that, and we've addressed the VAERS data many times before. That's the adverse events reporting system for vaccines. Um, any person can self-report into that, as can a health practitioner report into that. It is meant to be um, an all-encompassing sort of a canvassing of anything that could possibly happen. So if you got a vaccine today and two months later you had a stomach ache, you may think that's related to the vaccine, and you can report that on the system. And then it will be independently vetted and looked at in context of all the other thousands of reports coming in from states around the country. Um, so I would just caution people again that this system is not a verified vaccine was received, symptom occurred, and it was clearly related to the vaccine. It's a method for the CDC to accumulate as many reports as possible and then try to make some sense out of them and use uh, science to examine them and be able to report to the public what's going on. But again, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine in this country and even more around the world, and we're just not hearing people having long-standing significant adverse effects from them. Okay. Uh, Governor, uh, the Joint Rules Committee tomorrow will consider requiring legislators and staff and possibly everyone else to show proof of vaccination or take a PCR test before being allowed into the State House come January. What do you think of this recommendation? I think that's uh, for them to decide. I mean, it's a legislative body uh, and they are performing their duties like a, think of them as an employer. Uh, performing their duties in the state house, so um, we'll see what comes out of that. I, I haven't, I hadn't heard of the recommendations, to be honest with you, and I didn't, did not know uh, that they were voting on this tomorrow. So, I guess we'll all learn more tomorrow. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Henry F. VPR. You there, Henry? Hey, can you? Go ahead, Henry. Hi, Governor. Um, at the beginning of this press conference, you touted the vaccine and testing mandate for state employees that you implemented back in September. Um, since it appears that boosters are the best protection against uh, Omicron right now, will you mandate booster shots for state employees as well? Well, that would be part of uh, the fully vaccinated portion that we were talking about. And some of it will depend on what the CDC uh, says. But uh, but again, we're, we haven't fully contemplated that. But, uh, but as I said, um, I think to be fully vaccinated, uh, you need uh, you need the booster. So uh, it may be one of a, one of the strategies that we uh, we utilize, but we haven't uh, come to any conclusion on that at, at this point. Okay, so there's no timeline for when that might uh, 
when you would consider take, putting that in effect? No, but I, I would say uh, sooner rather than later. I mean, we're we're again looking at uh, all different types of approaches to make sure that we're uh, advocating for and uh, and um, concentrating on on the boosters uh, because we think they're so effective. Um, and I also wanted to ask about uh, the move to put patients in subacute care. Um, perhaps this is a question for Secretary Smith, but what are the outcomes for those who've moved to subacute care? Do you know, has anyone uh, died of COVID-19 after being moved to that setting? Uh, again, I'll, I'll let Secretary Smith answer this, but for those, the listeners, uh, so they understand the, the subacute beds uh, are for those who are not sick enough to be in the hospital, but sick enough so they shouldn't go home uh, and they need something in between. So that's why we created uh, this opportunity and made more space in some of the long-term care facilities so that they could get the help they needed uh, to transition back to, uh, to health and, and self-sufficiency. Thanks for the question. Typically, these aren't necessarily COVID patients. Um, they are patients that are, would be typically in the hospital. Um, they could be COVID patients, and I don't have the outcome numbers, but I'll try to find those for you. But the typically, what this is during a normal flow, you would find these type of patients going to either a rehab facility or a long-term care facility. With the staffing shortages that have impacted long-term care and uh, rehab facilities, what we found is that we needed to help those facilities find staffing, which we did in terms of uh, helping them finance the staffing and then move that flow that usually has happened in the past. And that's where we where we are most effective. Now, typically they wouldn't be COVID patients, they could be COVID patients, but they would be all types of, uh, of patients uh, with, with different needs in terms of rehab or, long, or longer term care facilities. Okay, got it. So, so this is essentially opening up space within the hospitals, uh, essentially boostering uh, or bolstering a um, an existing sort of path for for many patients who leave hospital care at a certain point. That's right. It's it's putting back the flow that normally was there that got interrupted because of staff shortages. Okay. Thank you. Leora, VT Digger. Uh, Secretary Smith, you might want to come back. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about our temporary staff. Um, I wanted to know how much we've spent to date on uh, hiring and assisting hospitals with travel nurses, and then how many travel nurses we have sort of hired thus far through the state or health hospitals hire, and uh, where are they in our system? Yeah, let me let me try to take those out. Where we have used travelers in our system is through a contract with Dale, uh, which is called the TLC contract. I mentioned it here uh, quite a while ago when we were having staffing issues at long-term care facilities. And that contract is uh, ongoing, and we do hire travelers through that contract in order to help supplement those long-term care care facilities that are hit with an outbreak lose some of their staff and we supplement their staff through their contract. We've expanded that in a couple of occasions where we've used it. I'm not aware where we have supplemented it yet for hospitals. We have talked about hospitals using some of the FEMA, uh, requesting some of the FEMA personnel for um, monoclonal, which I discussed today, as well as helping out in terms of very, very small amount of uh, EMS and paramedics in order to help out in those COVID uh, situations within a hospital at some of the harder hit hospitals. We were looking at Southwest, uh, excuse me, Southern Vermont, uh, Rutland Regional, and UVM 
in particular with a small workforce. What we found from FEMA is that they're pretty stretched thin. There are other states that are much worse off than, uh, than Vermont. Matter of fact, we're in pretty good shape when you look at the New England uh, data that Commissioner Pichek just uh, presented. So, you know, our requests are, are way low on the totem pole. And as I said last week, I, I don't know if we'll get those requests fulfilled or not. We'll have to see. On the monoclonal, they are fulfilling the request to have three teams in here, um, smaller teams, to help with uh, administration of monoclonals. In, in, did I get all your, um, did I give you all you needed? Yeah. I wanted to ask one quick follow-up. Um, I okay. think that a while ago we talked about um, uh, you guys assisting with bonuses and stuff like that for hospitals that didn't have enough staffing and, and you know, needed assistance. And so I was hoping that in your answer for the travel nurses, you might be able to sort of talk about the whole sort of cost for staffing that the state has sort of spent so far. Yeah, we've, there's, there's a lot of buckets that are out there that we've spent in this regard. That's why I was so um, insistent that people that have not been vaccinated get vaccinated because we've spent a lot of money, about $185 million. Um, when you put in the hospital station, uh, the healthcare stabilization fund that we've funded, uh, which helped um, bolster the financial position of several um, uh, healthcare organizations when we were um, basically when we were in a shutdown capacity for the healthcare system that helped get a lot of facilities through the crisis as well as uh, paying for I think I I have paid a two million dollars I haven't out of AHS I've paid two million dollars to um, two designated agencies to help with their staffing as well, and that's just recent, as well as other monies that have happened. But that, that $185 million is broken down in several buckets, but the biggest bucket of that is through the Healthcare Stabilization Fund, which you applied for and you got money through that, or you were in such a distressed uh, situation that we gave you money in order to get you through that, uh, that situation. Just a quick point of clarification, the two million, as of when did you guys spend that and for how long? Like that, what, what's, the, what's the time frame? That was just recent and it, w it goes out this week, I think. Gotcha, thank you. But, that, but I just wanna make sure that isn't the only money that went out to uh, designated agencies. There was, you know, out of the healthcare stabilization fund, there was considerable amount of money that went out through there, as well as prospective payments through Medicaid payments that we, that we did prospectively, um, meaning that we paid without the necessarily billing coming in and then, rec and then would reconcile later. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Governor, apologies for the amount of background in this question, but here goes. Um, there was an incident last week in which a man is accused of vandalizing nearly four dozen vehicles in downtown St. Johnsbury, uh, smashing windshields, gouging paint. Turns out this individual has been accused of similar behavior all over Vermont for months now including reportedly smashing windshields of six police cruisers in Burlington. Um, all told, he's been accused of damaging over 200 vehicles since spring, uh, and in some instances, causing well over $1,000 in damage per vehicle. Um, he's been arrested repeatedly several times. Prosecutors and judges have called for inpatient psychiatric evaluation only to be rebuffed by mental health, saying he didn't meet the criteria. Uh, he arrived in St. Johnsbury last week from central Vermont with a motel voucher placement uh, and caused the damage the first day he was here. Uh, police are frustrated because uh, they had no warning that an alleged serial vandal was being placed in town. Uh, clearly the dozens of area residents are frustrated because their vehicles have been damaged with little hope for compensation. Um, this, this situation seems to highlight a huge hole in the intersection between law enforcement, public safety, and mental health. Uh, what can be done to better protect Vermonters 
Uh, what do you say to the victims in St. Johnsbury who believe the state placed this man here with no warning and no consideration of his alleged criminal past? And what needs to change so the system doesn't continue to fail to provide the services that this individual uh, pretty clearly needs? Yeah, I'm not sure uh, if I'd classify it as a big hole, but certainly there is a crack in the system. And uh, I've read the account uh, myself. I hadn't heard of this previous uh, to what happened in St. Johnsbury. Um, but obviously frustrating for everyone involved. Uh, so we need uh, better communication. Uh, we're, we'll be working uh, within our um, umbrella, uh, you know, from the administration standpoint, uh, to see what we can do uh, to prevent this from happening in the future. Um, Secretary Smith would like to add something to that. Yeah, there was a, um, a bill that passed the legislature last year called S-2 that sort of helps with this communication aspect of it, but it still is not sufficient enough. Uh, I read about this case as well. This is, this is a situation where we need to be, have better communications between law enforcement, the judicial system, and mental health. And, you know, just sending a person to, um, to a mental health evaluation doesn't mean that that person meets the requirement of mental health. So we need to figure out a, a location, whether it's a forensic mental health facility or anything else that uh, we need to move forward on in this state. We've seen more and more cases like this where people are, are, are sent to a mental health facility that don't qualify for this, but what may qualify for a forensic mental health facility. We've seen people in EDs, for example, strike met um, medical um, providers in the EDs, and yet we don't have a facility where we could put these individuals. There's ongoing discussions right now uh, between the three brand between judiciary, law enforcement, and uh, mental health. I'm hoping out of that discussion, we can have really significant progress in where we put individuals like uh, the individual that you talked about and really have serious conversations about our forensic facility in the future. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, if I may, um, with for Secretary French, um, you said earlier AOE was working on plans to support schools with lower vaccination rates. Um, what might that support include and when would it be implemented? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we're organizing a meeting between the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Education here in the near future to start contemplating uh, those issues and I think specifically looking at uh, some of the communities that are likely to have lower vaccination rates. Um, so it's too early to tell, but I think it is something we're, we're moving towards after the first of the year. Um, and I think, you know, in a general way, what we're moving towards is a very targeted way of supporting uh, those communities. So looking specifically, uh, you know, where are the areas that they need support relative to improving vaccination rates? Is it a question of accessibility? Is it a question of communications? Uh, how can we help them implementing mitigation approaches like test to stay, or is it uh, symptom checking at the door and so forth? So I think, you know, we're acknowledging that we need to be prepared as a team to uh, provide sort of wraparound services for those districts that are going to have uh, lower student vaccination rates, because our, our guess is they're going to have a substantially different operating environment than those that have higher student vaccination rates. And still too soon to know which districts uh, are going to require that additional support? That's correct. Uh, we still have, uh, you know, as we mentioned, about 50% of this eligible population is either has their first dose or scheduled, but there's still a number of clinics that haven't been held yet in some, some communities. So we'll start to see those trends play out here after the first of the year. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Lola, VT Digger. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Great, thank you. Um, I, I just want to ask a quick follow-up, actually, about uh, student vaccination, and then I'll move on to my other question. But uh, have you guys given any thought as to whether uh, VDH will be including uh, the COVID vaccine on the list of mandatory vaccinations uh, for K-12 students, particularly once uh, we have full authorization? 
That'll be a Commissioner Levine question. <clears throat> it's actually not a question for any of us on the stage because uh, the current vaccine requirements are through legislative rulemaking process and um, we have not uh, been asked our input on that at this point in time. Um, around the country, most are reserving judgment on this right now while we're in the midst of the pandemic and not, I'm not seeing uh, school districts or states add this to their list of mandated vaccines at this point. I guess I just want to push back on that. My understanding of the process is that traditionally the legislature has legislated about exemptions, but not which vaccine to include on the list. That's, you know, maintained by VDH rule and regulation because usually it's the experts at the health department that are supposed to decide, you know, what exactly we should be vaccinating children with. Yeah, we have, we have not. Um, so are you, oh, sorry, let me just um, phrase my question. I mean, are you, is the administration expecting the legislature to make the first move on this then? No, I didn't want to imply that at all, but we have not had discussions about mandating vaccines for school children. Okay. Um, all right, well, my second question, um, and this is for the governor, is uh, about last week, your chief of staff, uh, went after a policy fellow at Dartmouth College on social media. On Twitter, actually, he called her desperate to prove a false narrative when she pointed to figures from Nevada, which has put in place a statewide mask mandate. Uh, now, this public health ex expert has been pretty critical of your administration, although she's also sometimes given you kudos. Uh, but she's, she's been right where you have been wrong on a few occasions. For example, she was really skeptical that Delta would burn itself out, even at the same time as your officials were predicting relatively confidently that that would happen. She predicted schools would experience widespread dysfunction, given the lack of planning that went into the year. You know, I heard Dan French say the other couple of weeks ago, no one could have predicted that this was going to happen. Um, and, you know, now some kids are missing 20, 30 days of school within the first semester. Meanwhile, our hospitals are bursting at the seams. Your own team is predicting that cases will rise. Um, and Anthocin is not alone in asking you to do more over the summer. Nearly 100 VDH staffers begged the health commissioner to take a stronger stance. She's been echoed by two former health commissioners, Jan Carney and Harry Chen. The Vermont chapter of the American College of Physicians is also calling on you to do more, including a mask mandate. So what I'm wondering is why your administration is dismissing critics, for example, Antoxin, and accusing them of operating in bad faith instead of listening to potentially new ideas, uh, because Vermont is on a pretty tr scary trajectory right now. Well, that's, that's your opinion, Lola, and uh, I'm sure we'll read about uh, your assessment of this issue tomorrow. Um, but from our standpoint, I, you know, I, I look at our overall response uh, to the pandemic, and I think that most would agree across the country uh, that we've been more right than wrong. Uh, it's not to say that we've done everything right, um, admittedly. Uh, none of us have. This is a new uh, phenomena. It's a new pandemic. It's something that there was no playbook. But again, I would say we've made a lot of the right decisions to put us in a position where we lead the nation in a number of categories. Uh, we still have the lowest number of deaths uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, per capita and uh, and overall. And so we have a lot to be proud of, and a lot of that is because of ideas we receive from. Uh, from individuals, we don't we don't have all the ideas. We listen to other uh, other people. We we watch other states. We learn from them, and then we glean whatever good information uh, they have uh, to make decisions that we think are in the best interests of Vermont. So, I I would disagree that we don't listen uh, to others because we've done a great deal of listening. That's that's been part of our success. Uh, but at the same time, we have. Our own. I have my own team of experts, and um, they advise me. We have 
very robust and and uh, robust debates uh, about wh where we go and what we should do. And uh, and again, I would just I would I would have to I get, uh, respectfully disagree uh, that we've been more wrong than right um, because if that's the case, um, there's a lot of a lot of states are in trouble uh, because we've we've done a lot of things right here in this state and a lot to be proud of. I, I didn't say that you had been more wrong than right. I'm saying this is a person who your own chief of staff is lashing out at who has been right in instances where you have been wrong. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, like, do you not think that Vermont is on a pretty scary trajectory right now, given the state of our hospitals and the fact that you are predicting that cases will rise? I think uh, we have been uh, fairly stable of late. Um, we are concerned uh, about the direction, and particularly with this variant. Um, but I, again, would say uh, we have been reactive uh, to the needs of Vermonters. I mean, look at their, you know, vaccination rates, uh, for instance. Uh, some of what I've said in my remarks, what, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated at this point. Uh, five percent are are the problem from my perspective, and so we need to continue to work on uh, getting them vaccinated or um, and and boosted for the rest of the population. So we have um, we have our own strategy uh, that uh, that I think is is working. We're still we're seeing some promising trends. I, th I think uh, Commissioner Pichek had shown where we're you know, getting uh, back in terms of hospitalizations, uh, we're the lowest in New England, I believe, at this point, or pretty near uh, the, uh, uh, the lowest. So, again, we're seeing a surge here in the Northeast. Um, we don't get it all right uh, and never have professed that we get it all right, uh, but, um, but we do more right than wrong. And, and in terms of the the issue, um, as you deem lashing out, I, I think that was, uh, you know, again, as part of uh, this press briefing where I stand up here, we stand up here for two hours uh, plus uh, every single week. And uh, and I think the question was about, there was something about Nevada, uh, Nevada being because they have a mass mandate uh, that their hospitalizations were lower than ours. Uh, we disagree. And we, uh, our, the chief of staff, uh, had a graph and and pointed that out. So I think we have to, in some respects, provide what we think is accurate information when we see that an expert, uh, your expert, uh, is saying something different that is not true. Um, so I think we have an obligation to set the record right. And and in this case, with the Nevada uh, uh, situation. Um, we have a lower hospitalization rate than Nevada, and and she was and she was and she was and she was wrong and she was wrong. I don't think her numbers were wrong, but the point is that you guys were accusing her of operating from a place of bad faith, right? Well, I I think I, again, it seemed pretty obvious to me that they were inaccurate uh, at best. So. I think we have an obligation to make sure that the, the public knows the truth and vice versa. I mean, if, if we're saying something that's not true, uh, you have an obligation and you've, uh, you've proven that, uh, uh, that you're willing to do that. You point out that we're not right. So we have an obligation to do the same. Do you think you have an obligation to do so with civility? Absolutely. Do you think your chief of staff was being civil? I didn't see anything uncivil with what he said, but I do think, I think to put this in context, and this is a lot of inside baseball, I think you would agree, Lola. Uh, most of the people listening to this probably have no idea what we're talking about. Um, but I think you should, you should present the entire uh, feed, uh, all of the back and forth uh, of the... Uh, of the Twitter um, response, I guess. <clears throat> so, and let, uh, let and show the it, it in its entirety, uh, so that Vermonters can make their own decision. Okay. Um, I 
think those are all of my questions, but I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Tom Davis. All right, we'll move to Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, yeah, I had a couple questions about our ICU capacity. First, could I could just get a confirmation on how many ICU beds we have available across the state as of today? It sounded like um, Commissioner Pichet said it might be 11, but I, he didn't sound too confident about yeah, that. I think we have, a, we have a total of about 100, 102 ICU beds, and I, think, I believe there are 11 available today. So we have a very small okay. number across the state the, the total number of ICU beds is fairly small in Vermont, so about 102, I believe, and we have 11 openings. Okay, so it's not the, I think this is the third straight week we've been hovering right around that 10, 11 area. Um, and then Commissioner Pichak could also mention that based on the data, the case data that we're seeing, you're able to pull some projections out of that um, based on how many people are getting sick in certain age groups. I'm just wondering what the data is telling you for the next couple of weeks when we think about hospitalization. Do you expect us to go back up to the um, level we were at a week ago, or do you expect those to hold steady, go down? Do you have any projections? You know, tough, tough to say because it really does uh, depend on the circumstances uh, in different areas of the state. Um, we have more vulnerable populations. We have uh, areas where we have an older population and uh, areas that are unvaccinated. So it really depends on where this this virus goes and uh, to um, understand the implications of that. So again, um, I'll let maybe Dr. Levine or Commissioner Pichek answer. Just Just quickly. Uh, we continue to be heartened by the fact that the number of cases on a daily basis that are in the 60 years of age and older group are in the 10 to 13 percent of all cases. That's very different than earlier in the pandemic. And we continue to have ongoing progress in boosters. So the more that we can diminish that age range's experience uh, using boosters, less hospitalization will be required. Now, as the governor said two hours ago, um, I think there were you know, perhaps a third of cases that are under age 60 in the 20s, 30s, 40s years of age range. Um, unfortunately, many of those are in the unvaccinated group. So if we can succeed in improving the vaccination rate for those, that will be helpful in predicting sort of future experience. But as you know, the major serious outcomes have been occurring in the older age ranges, and we continue to have excellent progress and hopefully continued progress with vaccination and boosters in those age groups, which should temper any holiday surges uh, that might occur. And then one other quick question um, on a totally different topic. Are 2021 unemployment benefits going to be excluded from income tax the way um, 2020 benefits were? I don't believe so, but I wonder if Mr. Harrington might be still on. Hi, thank you, Governor. Um, could you repeat the question? It just kind of broke up on my end. Sure, I'm just wondering if, if 2021 unemployment benefits will be excluded from income tax the way the previous years were. Uh, I haven't heard anything to that, but I'll, I'm happy to follow up and see um, if there's any legislation coming out that would support that, but um, not to my knowledge at this time. But let me do some uh, follow up and get back to you. Thanks. That's it, thank you all for enduring this longer than I thought was going to be a press briefing, but uh, we'll see you again next week.